Hello and welcome to another CLI Magic Variety Show. Happy Binary Day, 11-11-11. The last one we'll see for a century. Or thereabouts. So, I have some special things I want to go over. Or at least some pretty interesting tips that I think you'll like. The first one that I wanted to show was... Um, basically how to view just or affect just the directories when you're working in the shell. Uh, basically if you have like a lot of files here I don't really have too many files uh, and directories but sometimes you have so many that overflows the terminal and you just want to get them out of the way um, or you just want to be able to see the directories only. So what you can do it, you know you could do something like using the find command um, and you know even max depth one but that's a lot of typing and and you might think like oh, I don't want to have to type that in every time um, and I'll get hidden directories and maybe I don't want to see hidden directories so what you can do is just type in wildcard and then at the end of your wildcard um, put in a slash and it's important that when you do this like with LS that you use the dash D option um, otherwise you're going to end up get everything that's inside the directories maybe you that's what you want but in the case of LS you probably just want to be able to see the directories only just by their name and that's what the D option does if you want to see the hidden files uh, and directories, you can just put a dot in front and you can even do both at the same time. So this is a very handy thing to be able to do. Uh, I often use this when I want to uh, see how much space is being used in subdirectories like that and get a, uh, a total of, of all of it with the C. So that's a that's a pretty handy tip that I think will rock your world a bit. Um, the next thing I wanted to show, and I I really messed this one up when I when I posted it because I had used this technique uh, about a year ago and I kept, I had a copy of it in my um, CLI Magic Q and sometimes I go back and I recycle old tips that I had and um, I don't always retest them or I, I think oh they must have worked because I, I posted them before and I really need to stop doing that because there's a few of them where I, I goofed up and I didn't actually put the corrected version in the Q file and some people called me out on that and and I found out <laughs> the hard way that I had you know I had posted something that was misleading so anyways um, I had this situation where I uh, I need to check who was missing their .bash RC files because I had a server where some users didn't have their .bash RC files. Um, either they had deleted them or you know they had been created a long time ago uh, using a scale directory that didn't have it. So I you know you can use find to find files that are there but how would you go about f you know f finding who doesn't have uh, a file and you could do something like you know compare a list of all the users against what find found uh, and do something like that or you could do this basically use a for loop to give you the usernames and then then you do this uh, so right now all these users have uh, .bash rc file uh, so let me remove one of them okay so now we have a user that doesn't have their bash rc file and now I do this, you'll note that one of the 
you know, it's basically checking every user to see if it has a bash RC. So it's running like ls cli magic slash dot bash RC and then uh, Joe user slash dot bash RC and suso slash dot bash RC. And when it gets to somebody that doesn't have a dot bash RC, it's going to give this no such file or directory error. And you might think, well, that's, you know, usually that's not useful. I, I try to get rid of those kind of errors or I don't want them. But in this case, it can be helpful. And the way we can actually uh, see just those errors is by redirecting the normal standard output to dev null. So then I can get output where I just see the people who don't have .bash RC files. Um, and maybe I just want to see, you know, a quick output and just write, you know, copy the uh, the lines or whatever. Um, I could also do something like redirect that output to a file. Uh, and then, you know, then I have a list that I can work from. In the case where I was actually using this, I had hundreds of users to check against. So, you know, there was a lot of output where people had bash RC files mixed in with people who didn't and it helped to have an automated way to go through and actually check this. So this is another example of where you can use data that you normally wouldn't use uh, to your advantage um, when you're trying to do something like find a, f a file that doesn't exist. Uh, so that might that might help you to you know, give you some more ideas in your daily activities as to the possibilities of, of how you can solve a problem. This next one is about a problem I came up with where I had a, uh, I have a wiki, Bloomingpedia, uh, that I manage, and it's been getting spammers, um, you know, spammers have been attacking it by signing up for accounts and creating articles in the wiki gets quite a few uh, quite a few users signing up for it uh, that are you know spammers and legitimate users so it was becoming kind of difficult for me to filter out uh, which host names were were generating uh, the spam accounts and coming up with some kind of um, of list you know that that showed me who where these people were coming from so one thing I noticed was that uh, the articles that the spammers would create were always like you know over 35 characters or over 30 characters or something so I thought well what I can do is just look for anybody who posts uh, to the wiki um, to the sign up form of the wiki and has a return to in the uh, in the URL with a, a a page name that's longer than 30 characters and the way you do that is to use egrep um, and a regex in the right place so here's the part where I'm you know I'm basically qualifying the search by saying anybody who's doing a post and ha you know sign up they're doing a sign up and return to is a you know it's a, a query string variable that ends up in the sign up form to take you back to where you um, clicked on the sign up form from. So basically if you're on an article and you want to sign up to be able to edit it, uh, this sign up or this return to variable makes sure that you have a link that takes you back there. So I want to search for an article name here um, by saying nothing with a space in it. Uh, spaces are automatically turned into underscores or plus signs so they wouldn't actually show up as spaces um, here and I want to say 30 or more characters and the way you do that is by putting um, 30 in curly braces comma and then nothing which means on into infinity um, or 30 or more and then I'll search for uh, through the wiki access log so I immediately get results and I only care about the host name so I'll just filter that out 
And you can see, I already am seeing a lot of patterns. I can see that, you know, most of the spammers are coming from this steadfast.net and a few other places, that some of which I recognize, like indiana.edu, that's local to the wiki, so it's obviously a legitimate user. Um, and, com, you know, this Indiana Comcast thing is obviously a legitimate user. So, but I can quickly see that... Uh, um, you know, these are IPs that are probably where the uh, spammers are coming from, and I can generate a list to block. And that was just a, a nice way to actually use a regex to help me with that. Um, okay. Uh, the next thing I want to cover, I just I found out, I you know, for a long time I've been using. Um, well, let's okay. Let's say okay. I run that. So now my last argument is wiki dash access log. So one way you can get the last argument on the last line is to use bang dollar, which actually gives you the last argument and the last command you executed. And so that you know when you hit enter, it's actually going to to run your command with the last argument. Uh, another way that I discovered more recently is a more interactive way to insert the last argument on the last command in the history. It's imp I thought initially that it was it worked the same way as bang dollar, but it's slightly different. Um, like if I run, if I press escape period, it inserts the last argument. But what that's really doing is only taking the last argument, or it's, it's taking the previous history line's last argument. So it does the same thing as before, except for it doesn't actually print out the command substitution before running it, uh, like it does with the bang dollar. But you'll notice if I uh, say echo A, echo B, echo C, and then let's hit up arrow a couple times and then go to hit escape um, period and you might think that it's going to in insert the letter C but it's actually going to insert the letter A so yeah that's kind of interesting okay so it inserts the letter A and um, because that was the line previous to the one that I'm currently editing, which was the echo B. However, if I go back and hit dollar bang, then it says echo C, but because that was the last command that I actually ran, or, or that was the last argument of the last command I actually ran. So there is a difference between dollar, um, I'm sorry, bang dollar and escape period. And I just thought I'd let you guys know that in, in case you ever run into it. Um, I, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next thing I just wanted to show real quick was um, I didn't see a lot of retweets or questions about this one. I thought maybe people didn't understand what it was doing. Um, you know, one, one way that you can uh, find out if a host is active on a network is to uh, you know just ping it and that works a lot of the times but sometimes you have a problem where a host is actually filtering ICMP packets ICMP packets if you don't know are actually what ping packets are when you run the ping command. It's an it's doing ICMP echo request. ICMP is a protocol similar to like TCP and UDP. Uh, all three of those are part of the IP protocol stack of protocols. Um, so some, you know, like Windows hosts will oftentimes block ICMP packets by default. So you couldn't necessarily determine that a Windows host was up by pinging it. So another way that you can actually ping to see if um, a host is up is using a command called ARP ping. Um, and what ARP ping does is there's another layer below, there's another network layer below the TCP layer 
called ARP. And ARP is what, it's basically how a network switch determines what port you're on um, based on what IP address you have. So it's it's not something that people really generally know about. You know, it's it's something that like network admins and sysadmins know about um, because sometimes they have to deal with, with ARP problems, ARP caches and stuff like that when they change routes. So there's this ARP ping and this will only work on the local network. If you're if you can't like ARP ping yahoo.com or something like that, that won't work. That will actually uh, probably you'll always get a response because your router will just respond to it. Um, but so if I say ARP ping 192, you know, so on, uh, then it gives me the uh, the reply. And I don't have a host right now that I, that I actually uh, off the top of my head. Uh, that I can demonstrate the difference on. But essentially, I mean, you see right here, you're seeing the MAC address of the machine. And maybe this is kind of dangerous for me to show you because it gives a little bit of information away. Um, but essentially what it's doing is it's sending out an ARP uh, who request saying who has uh, the IP. And then because of the way ARP works, anybody who's on the network who has that IP has to respond or they're supposed to respond if they still want to be able to talk on the network um, and that's so when somebody does respond this ARP ping picks that up and says okay somebody responded so you know that IP is in use so it's it's kind of a it's kind of a more sure way of determining if an IP is being used or not and it's also a way to get the MAC address of the thing it, um, that's using it which is helpful because the first three um, hex codes in the MAC address can be used to determine like a manufacturer name, uh, which you know will be helpful in tracking down what it actually is if you have some lost host. Uh, I've used this several times when uh, we, you know, in a larger network, you might have people setting up stuff and, and using IPs and they didn't you know allocate the IP assignment with you and you have to track down what it is and it turns out to be some kind of network NAS device or something that somebody set up so that can be helpful um, for that too okay the last thing I wanted to show in this video uh, back in January of 2011 I demonstrated um, a trick using a for loop to to make UV image maps for uh, 3D programs. I I basically uh, I had this idea where I want to make um, picture cubes in Blender, and I wanted to make them fall down a slope or something. Uh, so I thought, well, how, you know, I don't, I have a bunch of these pictures here. I don't want to have to like go into GIMP and make the UV maps that I'd need to make, which basically the UV maps for these have to be like, um, you know, three pictures across and four pictures down in a grid, uh, where the pictures actually form a T. So instead of going into GIMP and actually doing this, I th I thought, well, there's got you know there should be a way that I can do this in the command line. So here I have 42 pictures, and I'm gonna make uh, seven UV maps out of them. Each cube having six sides. Um, so I have these pictures of uh, going to the zoo that I want to put on the sides of the cubes was use a for, um, use a f well I'll type this out and then you'll see so that's the each one of the seven cubes is what that for loop is for and this pattern is basically a template Each of the Z letters is going to be where a picture would go. Um, 
This pattern is going to be used to create the arguments for the ImageMagick Montage program. Montage is a program that lets you basically take a bunch of pictures and put them into one bigger picture or, or one smaller picture, but basically put the pictures uh, in a grid formation. So that, you know, it's, it's used to make like thumbnail uh, images and stuff like that. But you could also use it to do this. So uh, basically with this pattern, I'm making a template and then I'll use the for loop and said and a few other things to actually fill in the template with the actual image names for each of this uh, 4x loops. So, so that's the fourth z null and every time I put in a null that's going to be where there's not an image used and you'll, you'll see in the final montage how that uh, plays out it's basically where I don't need to have an image but I need to have some kind of white space to fill in the other parts of the grid okay so what this part does is every time I go through an instance of I want to pick up six images so I list out um, I list out the entire directory I'm in and then I take out six images first and I, I take out you know I I give myself a list of six images and then a list of 12 images and then you know 18 images and 24 and each time I'm taking the last six so every time through the loop this is going to give me the next six images that I need uh, to put into this pattern. And then here's where I actually substitute in the parts of the pattern, um, reassigning the pattern variable so, you know, with what it needs to take in. So here I'm calling said, I'm saying substitute a Z with the next image uh, that I'm passing to it and this um, triple greater than sign is basically takes this word and sends that as the input into said and then that gets assigned to the pattern so the pattern you know the entire pattern each Z every time gets replaced with the next image and then once that's done I run the montage program and this is all still within the 4x loop so I run the montage program. This is just some options that you need to set it up. This is to say that it's a three by four grid of images. Um, and the mode is concatenate mode, which uh, does what I want. You can read about montage more. You know, I mean, there's so many, there's so many options, it's kind of crazy. You can, you can do almost anything you want if you learned how to uh, do all the different options to the image magic programs. Okay, so then here's the where I put in the pattern and these would, you know, normally they would say, why don't you type in, you know, the list of file names or null if you don't want anything to show up there uh, in that spot. And then this is the output, and I'm going to actually put this in the parent directory. I could keep it in the current directory, and because of the way the files are named, I wouldn't have to worry about um, it eventually re you know reading in the montage files that I'm creating, because it wouldn't actually get that far, because it only goes to seven. Um, but just to keep it a little bit cleaner, and to remind everybody that you have to be mindful of uh, when you're doing this kind of work that you're creating files or that you're working with files and you don't want to end up in an infinite loop type of situation so I'm going to write those to the parent directory instead and then this echo is just so that I can keep track of what's going on as I run it okay so I think we're ready and we'll go ahead and run this and so every time it's echoing X that's creating a new montage image so it, you know it'll get to seven and then stop okay so there's my montage images and you'll see here how it's 
What happened? Okay, so I did something wrong. Let me... I probably got the pattern. I didn't get something in the pattern right. Okay, so it's Z, 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 Null, Z, Null. Oh, right. There's another Z here that I, I missed. Null. So basically, I mean, you can think of it like this. You know, top left, top, middle, top right. And then the next row, um, left, middle, right. I'm sorry. That's right. And then left, middle, right. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you have to think about how things are are working here. It gets a little bit tricky. So left, middle, right, left, middle, right. Uh, so let me run this again. This should work this time. And here, so here you go. So now I would go into Blender and I would assign that Blender has an interface for being able to unwrap a cube so it's flat and basically assign the faces um, to each one of these image sections. And then this white part actually wouldn't get assigned to anything. Um, so I have to play with it a little bit, but essentially it's made my image map possible. And it's a whole lot faster than trying to do this in... Uh, I'm not sure why it's doing that. It's probably because uh, I'm actually not doing this within my uh, host computer. I'm doing it within a virtual machine. So it's probably having some trouble with 3D stuff. So you can see how this made it a whole lot easier to actually make this image than trying to take each individual photograph into something like GIMP and actually make it... Um, and then the results are really pretty good. I'll have a link in the video uh, probably right here <laughs> that you can click on if you want to see the actual final results. Um, so thanks for watching.